One of the interesting things we learned about Papias in the preceding lecture was that he showed a distinct preference for oral over written tradition about Jesus. Let me reread for you the fragment of Papias' writings as preserved in the uh, church father Eusebius, where, you see, where, uh, where Papias points out that he used to interview the companions of the elders, meaning the uh, companions of the uh, original apostles, companions of Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, or Matthew, to see what these disciples had said about Jesus, as well as uh, the companions of the second-generation Christians, such as the elder John and Aristion. Why did he interview these people instead of simply re reading uh, the books that were widely becoming available to early Christians? It's because, he says, I did not suppose that what came out of books would benefit me as much as that which came from a living and abiding voice. This preference for oral rather than, rather than written communication stands somewhat at odds with modern sensitivities. People today tend to distrust oral traditions as hearsay and to prefer to have written documentation for events of the past. You just don't want to hear some rumor that somebody's spreading around. You want to see it written down in black and white. But in antiquity, oral sources were widely considered to be superior to written sources, since oral sources could be questioned and probed for additional clarification. The problem with the writing is that in most cases you don't have the author there to, to ask about any difficulties you have. Whereas if you're talking to an authority, you can, you can communicate with them and, and thereby elicit further information and clarification. This preference for oral overwritten communication had a strong philosophical basis from at least the time of Plato up to the Gnostics. Plato himself had an understanding that oral communication was superior to written communication, especially when it came to philosophical discourse. Plato thought that the written word was too wooden and not sufficiently elastic to contain the truth. Truth had to be worked out dialogically as a person would talk to another person and the back and forth, the point and the counterpoint uh, out of that back and forth would emerge the truth. So that Plato evidently uh, did not put down his uh, full philosophy in writing in any of, the disc any of the dialogues of Plato that survive, but he communicated the deeper truths to his students orally. In a religious vein, something similar uh, could be said about the early Christian Gnostics and their understanding of true revelation. Gnostics did think that, the, that written texts could contain truth. But uh, as you know, Gnostics believed in secret knowledge that could lead to salvation. People needed to learn the secrets of the world we live in and especially of our own existence in order to escape this evil material world. People needed the secret gnosis necessary for salvation. This gnosis could be embodied in the written text, but the written text is like the human body. It's a prison within which the truth is kept. The human body is a, tr is a uh, prison for the spirit, and the written word is a prison for the actual truth, the actual meaning of a text. It's interesting that in one of our uh, Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, we're told uh, at the very beginning, uh, the author says, These are the secret teachings which the living Jesus spoke, and Judas Didymus Thomas wrote them down. Anyone who finds the meaning of these words will not taste death. Well, the words are written down, so they're not saying the writing is of no use. But reading the written words is not what brings eternal life. It's having the proper interpretation of those words, which gets passed on orally. It's the oral communication that provides the secret gnosis necessary for salvation. Otherwise, the divine being Christ would not have come down to inhabit the, the man Jesus to deliver 
his secret teaching. He could have simply sent a book from heaven if that, was, if that would solve the problem. No, it's oral communication that contains the words of salvation. So at, a, at an early stage, and, and even on into later periods, there were people who preferred uh, oral to written communication. That's, that has a philosophical background, at least as, back, as far as Plato, and it's manifest in Papias. Eventually, though, within Christianity, it was the written word that came to play a more important role than spoken tradition, at least among the official representatives of Orthodox theology. And the reason isn't too hard to find. The reason that the Orthodox Christians ended up preferring the written word rather than the oral word was precisely because the written word, in theory, was established and secure. Once something's written, it's written. You might be able to change it by erasing it and writing something else, but by and large, something that's in print is written, and it stays the same. It stays written, it stays the way it was without getting changed. So some heretic can't come along and change it except by actually manually uh, scraping off the page and writing something else, which, which did happen, but didn't happen uh, nearly as much as happened at the oral level, when you can take any saying that somebody gives to you and say it differently. Uh, it's much harder to change written texts. Moreover, the ancient written records that the Orthodox Christians had available to them could be trusted, they said, to set forth the more ancient views of Jesus and his apostles, unchanged with the passing of time. And so if you have an ancient book, this ancient book records ancient views, and it, it stays the same. It's the same ancient view as it was when it was written 100, 100 years ago. Even with this ultimate preference, this eventual preference for uh, written over oral communication, in the earliest periods of Christianity, oral tradition played a vital role in the Christian religion. We can see this already in some of the comments that were made by the Apostle Paul in the years before there were any written accounts of Jesus' words and deeds. So let me just read a couple of passages from Paul which indicate that uh, Paul himself is dependent on oral tradition for some very important information. Paul's writing his letter to the Corinthians uh, in order to solve some of the problems in the community. One of the problems the Corinthians had was that they were misusing the Lord's Supper. And so Paul writes to them the proper way to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and he bases his, in, his interpretation of this ritual on words that have been handed down to him orally about how Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and following, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. So he received this orally, maybe through a prophecy, uh, and he hands it on to these others, his, his Corinthian congregation, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you, do this in remembrance of me. This is an oral tradition that came to Paul orally, that he passed along orally, and it's the basis for his discussion then of how the Corinthians ought to celebrate the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. A second example uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul wants to remind his readers of the basic gospel message that he proclaimed to them in the beginning. He says, For I, uh, for I handed on to you as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ Jesus died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas and the twelve. The two fundamental components of Paul's proclamation of his gospel, that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures, uh, in other words, fulfilling prophecy of scripture, and that he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. These two fundamental beliefs of Christians were passed on orally to Paul, and he passed them on orally then to, then to his Corinthian congregations. Not just Paul, but other early writers indicate the importance of oral tradition. The Gospel of Luke, for example, is forthright in explaining to its readers where the author acquired his information about Jesus. 
The author points out that many that he had had many predecessors who had written down accounts of Jesus based on eyewitnesses and servants of the word, he says. In other words, people have written accounts based on what eyewitness reports had said as these had been passed on orally. And he goes on to say that he also has gathered information and he's going to then provide an accurate account of what Jesus said and did during his ministry. This is based largely on oral traditions. Modern scholars are convinced that the fact that the traditions about Jesus circulated orally for so long before being written down played an important role in how these traditions came to be changed over time. This will be an important thesis of this lecture. That over time, with uh, when, when you're dealing with oral tradition, the traditions get changed. It's important for us to remember that the Gospels of the New Testament were written between 35 and 65 years after Jesus had died. Jesus' death is usually put to sometime around the year 30 A.D. It may have been 29, it may have been 33, it may have been 30, sometime right around there. The Gospel of Mark was probably our first Gospel written, written sometime around 65 or 70, which would be uh, 35 years or maybe 40 years after Jesus' death. The Gospel of John was probably our last Gospel of the New Testament to be written, written maybe around 90 or 95 uh, A.D., which would be uh, 60 to 65 years after Jesus' death. So that there's a 35 to 65 year gap between Jesus' death and these, our earliest accounts of his life. 35 to 65 years. Many of the stories found in these Gospels have come to the authors of the Gospels through oral tradition. In other words, people have been passing on traditions about Jesus orally for decades before they come to be written down in our Gospels. Now, some people don't see this as a problem. Uh, I've met a number of elderly people who say, I remember perfectly well what happened 60 years ago. I've never found that argument to be particularly persuasive, I have to say, uh, partly because of a personal experience where I've had perfectly vivid recollections of something that's happened to me in the past that I've turned out turns out later that I've completely misremembered. I don't know if you've had this experience, but it's not because I have a bad memory. In fact, I have a very good memory. But uh, uh, there are things, uh, just, one, one just occurred to me this morning, in fact. For years, um, I remembered from my high school days, uh, I was on the high school debate team, and we, we had won the state, state uh, championship in debate in Kansas. Uh, when I was a senior in high school. We were off to the National Debate Tournament, and I remember driving to the National Debate Tournament, and I remember perfectly well having parking problems in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and for years after that, uh, telling people that my first time in Pittsburgh was at the National Debate Tournament. About two years ago, a friend of mine who was on my debate team with me and I were having a discussion about going to the National Debate Tournament and he mentioned that uh, it was the first time he'd ever been in Wake Forest, North Carolina. I said, Wake Forest, North Carolina? It was in Pittsburgh. He said, no, it wasn't in Pittsburgh. It was in Wake Forest. I said, You're kidding. No, it wasn't. It was in Pittsburgh. No, he said, no, it was in Wake Forest. And it turns out he was absolutely right. I had remembered this for years incorrectly. Uh, and with nobody to correct me, I mean, I just assumed that I remembered it properly. I think this happens all the time. Uh, and even people who are convinced, oh no, I remember exactly what so-and-so said 20 years ago. I remember the exact words. I remember what I was wearing. I remember it. They might remember it or they might not remember it. But the reality is uh, you, you really don't know and things get changed in your head. They not only get changed in your head, they get changed when stories get told. The stories about Jesus were being told for 30, 40, 50 years around the Roman Empire, these stories surely got changed in the process of transmission. How could they not change? Everybody who tells a story tells it somewhat differently from someone else who tells the same story. This is especially true in oral cultures. Some people have the idea that in oral societies, 
since everything is oral instead of written, there's special care taken to make sure that things don't get changed in oral transmission. That's a common view, and it's absolutely wrong. Cultural anthropologists have shown, uh, shown on the contrary, that in oral societies, there is not a concern for verbatim, accurate reproduction of traditions. Oral cultures understand that when you're telling a story, you tell it for the occasion, for the audience you're talking to, for the particular situation that you're in, and the same story gets told differently on different occasions, depending who your audience is and why you're telling it, what the point is. The uh, early Christians lived in an oral society. These stories got changed in the process of transmission. The uh, life of Jesus was lived in first century Palestine. Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. By the time the Gospels get written, these stories have been in circulation, not just in Palestine. They've moved outside of Palestine, and they've been translated from Aramaic into a different language, Greek. And they've circulated in Greek throughout the entire Mediterranean. Some people have suggested that the stories couldn't be changed because the apostles were around to make sure that there would only be accurate traditions preserved. That's a crazy idea from my point of view. How could the apostles possibly be everywhere that somebody's telling a story about Jesus? There are hundreds of people being converted in major urban areas throughout the entire Mediterranean, and you've only got 12 apostles. They can't be guaranteeing the accuracy of everybody's story that's being told. So, stories are being told about Jesus, and they're getting changed. And I should say, this isn't just kind of a, you know, the liberal view from the professor from Chapel Hill. This, in fact, uh, it has evidence behind it. The evidence we have that stories were getting changed in the process of transmission is the fact that we have different versions of the same story in our written sources. People don't notice the differences in the gospel accounts of the same story because of the way people read the gospels. When people read the gospels, typically what they do is they, they do what you read a book. You, if you're going to read Matthew, you read through Matthew. And then you're going to read the next book, that's Mark. You read through Mark, and it sounds a lot like Matthew. And you read through Luke, and that sounds a lot like Matthew and Mark. So they sound a lot alike. And you don't notice that there are discrepancies between them because of the way you've read them. And I'm not saying you shouldn't read them that way. That's, that's of course, the natural way to read a book. But if you want to notice that there are discrepancies in the way the stories are told, you don't read them down at a, from top to bottom, in other words, vertically. You read them side to side. You read them horizontally. In other words, you take a story found in Matthew, the same story found in Mark, and the same story found in Luke, and you read the three stories against each other, and you compare them. When you do it that way, almost always you find discrepancies. Sometimes these discrepancies are so enormous that they cannot be reconciled. Uh, I spent a good deal of my time in my New Testament class at Chapel Hill trying to convince my students that there are all these discrepancies in the Gospels. And the point of it is not what my students think, that I just want to show the Bible's full of contradictions, you know, as if that's the thesis of the class. The Bible's full of contradictions, and I'm going to spend the semester proving it to you. That's not the point at all. The point is, these are different books. And you can't assume that when Mark says something, he means what Matthew means, because he's told the story differently. And if you don't see that there are any discrepancies, you won't read the Gospels that way. You'll read Matthew as, as if it's saying the same thing Mark is saying, which is saying the same thing Luke is saying, same thing that John is saying. And so you read all the Gospels as if it's one big money mess, and they're all saying the same thing. They're not saying all the same thing. And the way you know they're not saying all the same thing is because you have these different traditions. These different traditions that you find when you read the Gospels uh, horizontally apply, uh, applies when you actually read other traditions outside of the New Testament about the same materials. Give you an example. This has to do with uh, Papias, you'll be glad to know. Uh, there are traditions about Jesus that continue to circulate orally after the writing of the Gospels. And in the process, as they continued to be told, even after the gospel writers wrote them down, these stories came to be changed. This can be seen from some traditions found in Papias' book, The Exposition of, Expositions of the Sayings of the Lord. A striking example is the uh, account that Papias gives of the death of Judas. This is an interesting instance because of what happens within the New Testament itself. Now, everybody, uh, you know, everybody assumes or thinks that Judas went out and hanged himself after betraying Jesus. As it turns out, 
three of our Gospels don't say anything about what happened to Judas after his death. The death of Jesus, the, the death of Judas is recorded in only one of our Gospels. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, but it occurs in one other book as well, namely the book of Acts, which was written by uh, the same author who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so you've got an account by Matthew and you have an account by Luke. And as it turns out, it's very hard to reconcile these two accounts. And as we'll see, Papias' account is different also. People don't notice that Matthew and Acts disagree on this account unless they're told to read these accounts right next to each other. The way it works in Matthew is Judas has betrayed, and you can look this up for yourself. It's in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 and following. Just read it for yourself and you'll see what happens. Judas has been paid 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. Well, when Jesus, when he sees that Jesus is uh, bound for death, or, or when they've... Uh, uh, yeah, when they voted for his death, he repents of what he's done, and he brings the 30 pieces of silver, Judas brings the 30 pieces of silver, back to the chief priests and the elders. And he says, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they say, well, what's that to us? So he throws down the coins in the temple, and he goes out, and he hangs himself. The chief priests take up the money, and they say, it's not lawful for us to be to put it in the treasury because it's blood money meaning it's money that was used to betray somebody else's blood. And so they confer together and they decide to buy a, a field in which to bury foreigners. For this reason, the field has been called the field of blood to this day. Okay, So the money that Judas threw back into the temple was used to uh, buy a field to, bur to bury people, and it was called the field of blood because it was purchased with blood money. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what about the book of Acts? The book of Acts has a different account about Judas dying. It doesn't say anything about him hanging, in fact. And it doesn't say anything about 30 pieces of silver buying this field of blood. What happens in Acts, chapter 1, verse 18 and following, is that Judas had acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. Which sounds like he took the money and he bought a field. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. So he didn't hang himself. Somehow he, he fell head first. So I don't know if he dived off a cliff or what. But he, he, when he hit, his middle opened up, his, his, stomach, his stomach opened up, and his intestines all gushed out. This then became known to all residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language Hakaldama, that is, field of blood. Why is it called the field of blood? Because Judas spilled his blood on it. Both accounts agree that, uh, that there's a field connected with Judas' death that's called the field of blood. And that's something connected with Jesus betraying Jesus and something connected with him dying, but they do it in different ways. In one way, it's money, it's a field bought with blood money. In the other, it's a field in which Judas himself had bought that he spilled his blood on. So it's called a field of blood. So those are the very two. And so people try to reconcile these traditions. When people try to notice that there's a discrepancy, of course, you can always come up with a way of reconciling a tradition if you work hard enough at it. And uh, the way that this is typically reconciled is that Judas hangs himself, the rope snaps, he falls down headlong and bursts out and spills, spills his bowels on the, on the field, which I'm not quite sure how he would end up falling head first. But anyway, that's, that's, that's the way they, they reconcile it. Papias also has a story of Judas that's quite interesting. In Papias' account, Papias' account is quite different and even more graphic. This is what Papias said. Judas went about in this world as a great model of, of impiety. This is after the betrayal. He became so bloated in the flesh that he could not pass through a place that was easily wide enough for a wagon. Not even his swollen head would fit. Okay, so he couldn't walk down the street because not even his head would fit down the street. He's gotten so bloated. They say that his eyelids swelled to such an extent that he could not see the light at all. And a doctor could not see his eyes even with an optical device. So deeply sunken were they in his surrounding flesh. And his genitals became more disgusting and larger than anyone's. <laughs> Simply by relieving himself to his wanton shame, he emitted pus and worms that flowed through his entire body. 
<laughs> so, so he's being punished. <laughs> and they say that after he suffered numerous torments and punishments, he died on his own land. And that land has been, until now, desolate and uninhabited because of the stench. Indeed, even to this day, no one can pass by the place without holding his nose. This was how great an outpouring he made from his flesh on the ground. So this seems to be rooted in the idea of Luke, that he fell forth and, and gushed out on the ground. But you have the reason for how that happened. He'd gotten so enormously fat that when he, when he hit, it just everything fell out and left this huge stench. Well, so this is, this is evidence of an oral tradition that is continuing on in early Christianity as the tradition continues to be changed with the telling of the story. There's another interesting oral tradition found in, um, in uh, the writings of Papias that is probably the best known passage in Papias. Uh, I think it's probably the most frequently quoted passage in Papias because there's a passage in which Papias uh, informs us who the authors of our Gospels were. This is the first time we have any indication from any author who wrote the Gospels. He doesn't talk about all four Gospels. He doesn't mention Mark or uh, doesn't mention uh, Luke or John in this little fragment we have, but he does mention Mark and Matthew. And the question is, is he talking about our Mark and Matthew or about other books? This is what he says. This is what the elder used to say. The elder, says Papias, used to say that when that when Mark was the interpreter of Peter, he wrote down accurately everything that he recalled of the Lord's words and deeds, but not in order. For he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him, but later, as I indicated, he accompanied Peter, who used to adapt his teachings for the needs at hand. Notice, oral tradition. He used to adapt his teachings about Jesus for the needs at hand not arranging, as it were, an orderly composition of the Lord's sayings. And so Mark did nothing wrong by writing some of the matters as he remembered them. For he was intent on just one purpose, to leave out nothing that he had heard or to include any falsehood among them. So he writes down the sayings of Peter, that Peter rearranges for the occasion, and Mark writes them down as best as he can remember them. Now, I, I assume he's talking about our Gospel of Mark. Uh, I have no real reason to, to doubt that. I, I guess he's talking about our Gospel of Mark, but there's nothing here that makes us sure that he's talking about the Gospel of Mark that we have. See, I mean, there's nothing that shows us that, but perhaps he is. It's more controversial with the second uh, brief comment that he has about the Gospel of Matthew. About Matthew, he says this, And so Matthew composed the sayings in the Hebrew tongue, and each one interpreted them to the best of his ability. Matthew wrote down the sayings, presumably the sayings of Jesus, in the Hebrew tongue, and each one interpreted them to the best of his ability. This is often taken as a reference to our Gospel of Matthew, but I don't think he's talking about our Gospel of Matthew. For one thing, our Gospel of Matthew is much more than the sayings of Jesus. It's also narratives of his deeds and his passion. Moreover, Matthew was not written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek originally, as linguists have shown beyond any doubt. Now, maybe Papias didn't know it was written in Greek. Maybe he thought it was written in Hebrew. Or maybe he's talking about a different book, actually written by somebody named Matthew. Our Gospel of Matthew, of course, uh, doesn't claim to be written by somebody named Matthew. So I don't, I don't think he's referring to our Matthew. I suppose he's referring to our Mark, but I, uh, it's hard to be completely sure. In any event, what is clear is that oral traditions about Jesus and the Gospels came to be embodied in yet later written accounts. We have other Gospels that have been discovered, some in modern times, some uh, very recently, uh, and some uh, throughout the, the centuries past. Other Gospels in which Jesus is said to have said and done a wide range of things. We have Gospels about what Jesus was like as a five-year-old boy the infancy gospel of Thomas. We have gospels that talk about what actually happened when Jesus emerged from the tomb, uh, his resurrection, the gospel of Peter. We have gospels that contain his secret teachings, the interpretation of which will lead to eternal life, the Coptic gospel of Thomas. We have gospels in which Jesus gives mystical reflections about how this, how this world came into being as a cosmic disaster when there was a disruption in the divine realm the Gospel of Philip and the secret Gospel of John. We have uh, 
Gospels in which Jesus gives a revelation to one of his followers after his resurrection to give them the truth necessary for salvation, including, for example, the Gospel of Mary, one of the Gnostic Gospels. A range of Gospels from early Christianity that shows that in the oral, in the oral tradition, the uh, sayings, and Je- sayings and deeds of Jesus came to be changed in the passing of time before the Gospel authors wrote them down. To sum up, as the fragments of Papias show, oral tradition played an enormously important role in early Christianity. Both before and after, the accounts of Jesus' life were written down by the anonymous authors of our New Testament gospel.